its essence is not a something. It is a somebody. His name is Jesus Christ. When truth is called alive, the lights go out, darkness falls, and indeed, if your light is darkness, how very deep will the darkness be? All the words in this book can be compressed into one word, the eternal word, Jesus the Christ. The sacraments of faith, they're called the sacraments of faith because faith is a prerequisite for the reception of the sacraments, and the sacraments also strengthen and make present the faith of the people of God. Evangelization is a key word today, new evangelization, re-evangelization. We have to be very concerned about evangelization. Why? Because if you're not evangelized, and catechesis is a distinctive moment, as the Holy Father teaches, in the process of evangelization, if you're not evangelized, you're not fully open to God's grace, which you receive through the sacrament. So evangelization needs to precede and accompany the ministry of the sacraments. Number 1122 of the catechism addresses this. Christ sent his apostles so that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name to all nations. The mission to baptize and so the sacramental mission is implied in the mission to evangelize because the sacrament is prepared for by the word of God and by the faith which is assent to this word. We have to be very, very, very concerned about evangelization in the church today. A great number of Catholics are not evangelized. They go from beginning to end receiving the sacraments, but they're not evangelized. They don't really know their faith, and worse than that, have they entered into that mystical, beautiful intimacy with Jesus Christ that we're called to enter into. You've got to have a relationship. You've got to have a personal relationship with the living God in order to appreciate and make the best of everything that he's offered us, and he's offered us the kingdom. And so we want to have that relationship and evangelization helps to bring people into that relationship. The people of God is formed into one in the first place by the word of the living God. The preaching of the word is required for the sacramental ministry itself, since the sacraments are sacraments of faith, drawing their origin and nourishment from the word, the eternal word, not a dead word, the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The word of God is Jesus. He's the word. We draw our power from the word. Preaching has to be something alive in the church. Preaching is supposed to be the primary mission of bishops. Preaching precedes everything else in the order of time. And if you don't preach the word, especially by your example, as well as by your words, then the people of God are impoverished, diminished in their faith. And so every one of us has to be very concerned to enter into this work of preaching the word. You don't have to go out on a street corner. You preach the word by your good life, by your witness. Our young people who are walking to Washington, D.C., they're engaged in the kind of preaching that St. Francis of Assisi talked about one time. I mentioned this to you to you once before. St. Francis said to Brother Leo one day, Brother Leo, let's go preach in town. And so off they went. And they got to town, and St. Francis and Brother Leo walked around the, the town square several times in silence. And then they left. And Brother Leo said, but, but Father Francis, I thought you said we were going to preach. 
St. Francis said, we just did. The people looked at them. They, know, they knew who they were. They saw them living holy poverty. They saw them evangelical witnesses that they were, and they were touched by that example. They're walking for life across this country, a country that's supposed to say, in God we trust, and not just say it, but believe it and live it. Well, that's a witness. That's a preaching. They're preaching the word of God by their example. Every one of us is called to preach the gospel first by our actions, and some of us then also with words. We can do it in our family, and you can do it in a quiet way. You don't have to be pushy about it. You don't have to be very vocal about it all the time. Your quiet witness to the truth will go a long way to converting the hearts and minds of people, many of whom have exchanged the truth of God for a lie and begun to worship the creature rather than the creator, as scripture says. And so we need to give witness. Now the purpose of the sacraments is to sanctify us. That's why Jesus instituted the seven sacraments. That's why he sent the Holy Spirit, the sanctifier, to sanctify us. Sanctify means quite simply to make us holy, to help us to become who we are by our baptism. We are called to be the living presence of Jesus Christ. Sanctification, which is the work of the Holy Spirit, quite simply is being conformed to Jesus Christ, becoming the living presence of the Lord Jesus in the world. That's the Father's will for you and for me, that we become Christ to the world. That's what it means to be holy, to become Jesus to this sad, darkened, pained world. And so the sacraments help us to do that. They build up the body of Christ. And also the sacraments are, of course, to give worship to God, perfect praise and worship to God. The church believes as she prays. Here we come to another one of those principles that I bring up from time to time, an essential principle. Grab the principle and you'll be able to solve problems. It's like teaching a man to fish rather than just giving him a fish. You know, you can give a man a fish and he won't starve to death that moment. But then what about tomorrow and the next day and the next month? If you teach him to fish, he can take care of himself. Well, if you teach the faithful principles, they can take care of themselves. So here's one of those principles. The church believes as she prays. There is a direct correlation between the official prayer of the church, liturgical prayer, and the doctrine of the faith. We pray as we believe. There's to be a concordance, a unity between how we pray and what we believe. As the Catechism teaches us, number 1124, the church's faith precedes the faith of the believer who is invited to adhere to it. When the church celebrates the sacraments, she confesses the faith received from the apostles. Thus the ancient saying, lex orandi, lex credendi, or legem credendi, lex statuit supplicandi. According to Prosper of Aquitaine, the law of prayer is the law of faith. The church believes as she prays. Liturgy is a constitutive element of the holy and living tradition, with a capital T. Liturgy is very, very important. You don't want to start messing with liturgy, because to mess around with liturgy impacts on the doctrine of the faith. There is a direct correlation between what we believe and how we pray. And in liturgical celebrations, if you carry on that liturgical prayer in a way, for instance, which indicates that someone that we say is there really, truly, and substantially, you indicate he's not really there by your irreverent attitude, by entering into a kind of mundane and even profane way of carrying yourself, that way of praying doesn't indicate what we believe. Lex orandi, lex credendi, we pray as we believe. 
what we pray, how we pray in the church, shows what we believe. You know, if you really believe that Jesus is truly substantially present in our churches in the Blessed Sacrament, that has to affect the way you comport yourself in church. That has to affect the way you pray. That has to affect the way we celebrate our liturgy. It has to. And if it doesn't, it's a danger. And so we need to enter into a prayer that reflects that real doctrine that we hold. We don't make up that doctrine as we go along. It's something we receive. It's a treasure, the pearl of great price. Where did we get it from? Jesus taught it to his apostles, and the apostles handed it on faithfully to their successors, the bishops, throughout the ages. The faith, the doctrine of the faith, authentic liturgical celebration, which are consistent with, with each other, that's handed down through the ages. We do not make it up as we go along with every whim and fancy of a given time or place. Culture is a factor, but culture can't change essential elements of liturgy or doctrine. But culture should be taken into account. Yes, we, our language should be used. It's a wonderful thing that we have liturgy in the vernacular. Why? Because liturgy is to be praised. Now, Latin is the language of the Roman Rite, and it should be reverent. However, I don't know how many people in here know Latin well enough to pray it from the heart. You might know a few words. You might even be able to read it. You know, I can, but I'll tell you, I can't think in Latin. And so I can't pray from the heart in a language that I don't really know. So it is a blessing. Do not be confused. It is a blessing that we are now allowed to pray in our own language the liturgical prayer of the church. It's a great, great blessing. It's not a curse, as some people think, but you have to understand why. Neither is that an excuse to throw out everything that went before. There's a balance. Praying in the vernacular and the liturgy is a great blessing, but reverence should still be preserved. The greatest reverence is not a barn the house of God, and so we should act as though God is truly, really, and substantially present there. Number 1125 of the Catechism basically says what I just said. For this reason, the reason being the lex orandi, lex credendi, for this reason, no sacramental right may be modified or manipulated at the will of the minister or the community. You have your catechism, read it. For this reason, no sacramental right may be modified or manipulated at the will of the minister or the community. Even the supreme authority in the church may not change the liturgy arbitrarily, but only in the obedience of faith and with religious respect for the mystery of the liturgy. Now that quite simply means that liturgy unfolds throughout the ages and the essential elements of it can't change. Accidental things can change and should change. Whether we say Mass in Latin or English or French, that is not an essential element of the Mass itself. It's an important element, certainly but it's not an essential element. The principal parts of the Mass, for instance, you couldn't do away with the consecration or change the words such that you're saying something other than what the Lord said in the beginning. You can't change that. The Pope can't change that. The essential parts of the sacraments can't change. But don't be confused into thinking nothing can change. Certain things can change in liturgy. Certain things should change in liturgy, but other things cannot. Why? Because they affect the very essence of the seven sacraments. And so know where the lines are and accept the blessing that we've been given. The sacraments 
of salvation. The sacraments are given to us for our salvation. Celebrated worthily in faith, the sacraments confer the grace that they signify. They are efficacious because in them, Christ himself is at work. It's Jesus who baptizes. It's Jesus who is the high priest celebrating the Holy Mass, the Eucharist. And because of that, they're efficacious, and they confer the grace which they signify. Now, I mentioned before to you, I'll briefly touch on it again. Sometimes a little repetition can help us to learn. Psychologists say that there's some studies that indicate you have to hear something 17 times before you really get it. So I'm going to spare you, and I'm not going to say it 17 times, but the, the, I think the point is well taken. We need to hear certain things many times in order to finally get it once and for all, to interiorize it. The ex opera operato factor, the sacraments work in virtue of their own power, okay? By virtue of the saving work of Christ, the sacraments, by the very fact of their operation, they're efficacious, okay? So, if you intend to do what the church does at baptism, okay, you have a priest or a deacon, the ordinary ministers of baptism in the Roman rite, he intends to baptize. He pours the water or immerses the person in the water. And he says, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That baptism takes place in virtue of the operation of the sacrament itself. All right, so yes, it operates by its own power. But once again, the fruits of the sacraments also depend on the subjective disposition of the one receiving those sacraments. So it is not a matter of indifference that many of our young people, when they come to confirmation, go through it grudgingly. It, you gotta do it. Mom's gonna boot your behind if you don't get confirmed. Well, not, you know, that's something, but not good enough. Now, do they receive the sacrament anyway? Yes. The sacrament is valid, as long as it's validly celebrated, certainly. They get the sacrament. That seal goes on the soul, that indelible mark. If they're in a state of grace, the grace operates to some degree. To what degree depends upon your subjective disposition. It matters how well disposed, how badly disposed we are. If you're there out of pure being forced into it, that's not so good. Now maybe there could be an argument, well, better to, that they get it, and then later, maybe their disposition will improve. Yes, I can, I can accept that. But what we want to do is we want to try to impress on the church the importance of our disposition in order to receive more of the fruits of the sacraments rather than less. We have become minimalists. We've become minimalists in many places within the Catholic Church. Do what's barely necessary according to the law, my obligation. Well, I go to Mass on Sunday, but don't you talk to me about God on Monday. There are people like that. There really are. After all, I'm going. A lot of people aren't going on Sunday. That's true. God bless you for going. It's true. Better than nothing. But why settle for less when you can have it all? And we need to stress this. You know, sometimes people today say, oh, you can't tell young people that. Let me tell you something. I got a response to that. One word. Hogwash. Our young people are idealistic, and they are beautiful, and they are open to the grace of God if you will help them, if you will show them, if you will give them example. Don't believe it. Show up at Franciscan University of Steubenville sometime when there's a youth conference going on in the summer. Go into one of those tents. 
go in there when there are 2,500 kids up all night in adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, giving praise and honor to God. You don't believe the kids don't want to. You haven't seen what I've seen. But we have this very decadent attitude. We don't want to talk about it too much. Oh, let's not, let's not impose anything on them. Give glory to God. Get with it, folks. Give glory to God. You know, our Protestant brethren do it, and we need to do it. Don't hold back. When I was discerning my vocation, in the beginning, I was appalled at how many vocation directors tried to convince me that I should join them because, well, we don't do penance anymore. We don't wear the habit anymore. We go to the beach. We go to the movies. We do this. We do that. We don't pray so much. We don't have this, that, and the other obligation. And I wanted to say, cut it out. I'll stay in the world if I want to be worldly. They're afraid. They're afraid and they're defensive. You will never attract people to religious life, to the priesthood, or to the Catholic Church with that kind of defensive attitude. Give glory to God. Live the faith. Live it with a little force, with a little conviction. And I'll tell you what will happen. We'll have to start building churches instead of closing them down. The people will flock to the church. Now we'll talk about the sacramental celebration of the Paschal Mystery. Liturgy is an action of the entire Christ. Jesus the head, we the members of his mystical body. It's an eternal liturgy. It's in this eternal liturgy that we enter into, that liturgy that I spoke of before of the heavenly Jerusalem. We enter into that liturgy. We make it present in time and space. We celebrate liturgy with signs and with symbols. We know that there are signs of the human world, the elements like water and oil that we use in sacramental celebrations. There are signs of the covenant. There are signs taken up by Christ, sacramental signs which we use. These signs, which are sense perceptible, once again, they effect, they make happen what they signify. And so signs are very important. A sacramental celebration is a meeting of God's children with their Father in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. This meeting takes the form of a dialogue through actions and through words. The liturgy of the Word is of enormous importance. We have to meditate on the Word. You know, we should read the Bible every day or pray the liturgy of the hours. We should, you know, our, our Protestant brothers and sisters, in some respects, are tremendously good examples for us. They reverence the Word of God. And we should reverence the Word of God. After all, what is it? It's the Word of God. What is the Word of God? Not a something. The Word of God is a somebody. Jesus is his name. That's why we reverence the Word of God, because the Word of God is none other than the Son of God. All of the Old Testament spoke of Jesus, the eternal Word, in veiled languages, in types, in figures. The Old Testament all pointed towards the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed of God. What's he anointed with? the Holy Spirit. And so the Word of God is to be approached with great reverence. The Word of God is the truth. The truth is life. The truth will set you free. And if you want to be free with the glorious freedom of the children of God, not some illusory worldly freedom which says freedom is to be able to do whatever you want to do, that's not freedom, that's a lie. That's license. And it leads to slavery. If you want to be truly free, then you've got to enter into the truth. For there is no freedom outside of the truth. For Jesus said, you will know the truth if you obey my commandments, if you are truly my disciple. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you 
free. Free with the glorious freedom of the children of God. And so we celebrate with words and actions. We reverence that word of God. Certain liturgical actions are signs to us. They indicate certain things. Singing. Music is of enormous importance in liturgy. We need a real renewal, a real reform in liturgical music. It's a sacred action. Now, that doesn't mean there's only one kind of music that you can use in liturgy. Uh, I've seen some magnificent liturgical celebrations uh, in Africa, for instance, uh, for our culture. And for some, you know, we're, we're quite conservative, you know. We, we old Americans, we're, we're pretty, in a sense, pretty stodgy quite often. And when we see how some of our African brothers and sisters celebrate the liturgy, we might be taken back by that. But let me tell you, it's great. They love God. They're in love with God. And, and through a, a very animated kind of singing and even liturgical dance, which is acceptable in certain cultures in certain cultures, like in Africa, where it's very expressive of spiritual realities. It is acceptable, and you have to study the church's documents on that to know that. In certain cultures, it's not acceptable, because dance doesn't indicate those spiritual things in certain cultures. And so you have to know what's what, and you have to be consistent with what's proper and what's not so proper. Now, when is the liturgy celebrated? Time is very important. Time is a gift given to us by God. We are to sanctify time. We have liturgical seasons which help us to interiorize the Paschal mystery. We have Advent, a time of preparation for the coming of the Lord. Yes, he comes at Christmas, but let me tell you something. That's the first coming. There's another coming. The Lord is coming. The Lord is coming, and he's coming soon. You don't believe it? Well, he might not come for a 1,000 or 10,000 years for the second coming, but let me tell you something. The Lord is near. The end is near for you and for me because you're not going to live too much longer, and neither am I. 20, 50, 100 years? What's that? Nothing in the context of eternity. Jesus is coming. Advent prepares for the coming of the Lord. And so we open ourselves during Advent and we prepare for the coming of the Lord. Lent is another preparation, a time in the desert. Jesus went to the desert for 40 days and what happened to him there? He met the devil. He was tempted. He suffered privation and want. And then what happened? Well, he won. He, he got through it all. He resisted all the temptation, showing us the way. That's why he did it, to be a model for us. And then what did he do? Only then did he enter his public ministry. And that's a lesson for us. Lent helps us to learn that without penance, without penance, you're not really ready for active ministry. Penance isn't a dirty word. Penance hasn't gone out of style, although you'd think so. Do you know that Friday is the day of penitential observance? Most people think that when that change came, the only thing that happened was, well, we can eat meat now. You can eat meat now on Friday. Well, that's true. That happened. The document that you want to refer to is Penitimony by Pope Paul VI. And yes, it changed the discipline of penance in the church. Yes, you can eat meat on Friday now, but Fridays remain a day of penitential observance and not just in Lent. Oh, you can eat meat on Friday, but you've got to do some penance on Friday. And most people don't even know that. That was the real change that took place. Yes, now we can choose what form of penance to do on Friday. But do penance, we must. In Lent, we have a special emphasis on it, on penance to, to train us. It's a time of joy. Why? Because it's a time of grace. Penance brings down grace and helps to conform us to the Lord Jesus. The Lord's Day is a time when liturgy is celebrated in a special way. The Lord's Day, Sunday, is Easter. It's the celebration of the resurrection. 
You ever wonder where that word came from, Sunday? Well, it has sun in it. The day of the sun, the day of the rising of the sun. It's a day of light, a day of glory. It's the day when the Lord rose. Who's he? He's the son, the son of justice, the son of God, the son of Mary, the son of man, the son. Sunday, we celebrate his resurrection on Sunday. Holy uh, days, like, uh, oh, the sanctuary days, the celebration of the feast days of the saints, you know, the, the celebrations of Our Lady's Feast, uh, August 15th, the Assumption, January 1st, Mary, Mother of God, the Feast of the Martyrs, the Apostles, the various religious in the, in the church and the laity who became saints. We celebrate those feast days, so we sanctify those times. They're special times for celebrating liturgy. The liturgy of the hours, that's the, the office, the divine office, like priests and religious pray. You know, lay people can pray the liturgy of the hours, too. A lot of the people, uh, the lay people in my society of apostolic life, we pray the liturgy of the hours, our laity, many of them pray the liturgy of the hours, at least morning and evening prayer. That's liturgical prayer. That's an entrance in to the prayer of the church throughout the world. And it is very beautiful to enter into that prayer. Most of my life, I live in solitude. You know, you see me one day a month, and a few other days I might go someplace and preach. But the vast majority of my time is spent in solitude, in the woods, in a hermitage, or in other forms of solitude, so that I can be alone with God. You know, I don't have anything to say unless he gives me something to say. And I've got to be alone with him in order to interiorize the word, the one who is the Father's only word. And so that prayer is important to me, and I pray the liturgy of the hours. Uh, yes, it's much more expressive when it's with a congregation or with your religious community, but you know when I'm alone up on the mountain in my hermitage, and I pray morning prayer like I did this morning, or any of the prayers of the Liturgy of the Hours, I feel immersed in the church. I'm right in the heart of the church because I'm praying the prayer of the church. I've entered into that prayer of the community, liturgical prayer. And it makes me feel that, yes, all my brothers and sisters are here with me because I'm praying the same prayer, basically, that the whole church throughout the world is praying on that given day. Now, where is the liturgy celebrated? Well, basically, liturgy is celebrated in spirit and in truth. The worship in spirit and in truth of the New Covenant is not tied exclusively to any one place, the Catechism teaches us. The whole earth is sacred, and it is entrusted to the children of men. What matters above all is that when the faithful assemble in the same place, that they are the living stones gathered together to be built into a spiritual house. For the body of the risen Christ is the spiritual temple from which the source of the living water springs forth. Incorporated into Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are a temple of the living God. And so liturgy can be celebrated any place. I've celebrated Holy Mass on mountaintops, on, believe it or not, ping pong tables in prisons. You know, they have no chapel. They have no altar, and so you don't fail to celebrate the Holy Mass for the poor prisoners. You do it where you have to, and we're, that's sanctified by the very action that's there. Yes, we prefer to do it in the church when we can. The church is something special, something set aside for God, and that's the normative place where liturgy is celebrated. A church is a house of prayer. This is the church's own definition. I, I like and I accept and I use the church's own definition about herself because I don't have a better idea than my Holy Mother, the church, for she is filled with the Holy Spirit who overshadows her, who guarantees her the truth, and who works through her. And the church says that a church is a house of prayer in which the Eucharist is celebrated and reserved where the faithful assemble 
and where is worship the presence of the Son of God, our Savior, offered for us on the sacrificial altar for the help and consolation of the faithful. This house ought to be in good taste and a worthy place for prayer and sacred ceremonial. In this house of God, the truth and the harmony of the signs that make it up should show Christ to be present and active in this place. Once again, signs are very important. A Catholic church should not look like the inside of an empty refrigerator. It is not a Quaker meeting hall, and there's nothing wrong with Quaker meeting halls for Quakers. But a Catholic church should look like a Catholic church. Now, what does that mean? It means that certain things should be present. It doesn't mean it has to be cluttered up with 103 statues of every saint that we know of. But it means there should be some signs. It means there should be a crucifix. It means there probably should be some image of our Blessed Mother. It means there should be an altar. It means there should be and has to be a tabernacle. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Matter of fact, I'm going to talk about it right now because it comes next. <laughs> Number 1183. The tabernacle is to be situated in churches in a most worthy place with the greatest honor. That means not in a broom closet. Let me tell you something. This is part of what I was talking about before. We pray as we believe, and if we believe it's Jesus who is there, then you do not treat him as though it were bread or something mundane, something profane. If it is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, then put him someplace noble and beautiful. That's something the church wants. And anyone who goes against that is not acting with the mind of the church. And so it says... The tabernacle is to be situated in churches in a most worthy place with the greatest honor. The dignity, placing, and security of the Eucharistic tabernacle should foster adoration before the Lord, really present in the blessed sacrament of the altar. This is not insignificant. This is very relevant at this time and in this stage and in this place in history. Very important. Now there is unity and there is diversity in this mystery of the liturgy. From the first community of Jerusalem until the parousia, it is the same paschal mystery that the churches of God, faithful to the apostolic faith, celebrate in every place. The mystery celebrated in the liturgy is one, but the forms of its celebration are diverse. Now this, once again, is a principle. You want to know where the lines are. Please, please do not discredit yourself and the truth by running off half-cocked with a little bit of knowledge. A little bit of knowledge can be dangerous. You want to know where the lines are. So, you know, your, your pastor or someone may do something that you think is a little different. It, it may be perfectly permissible. You know, there is a latitude. There is a diversity that's allowed. And so you want to know where the lines are. And always give people the benefit of the doubt. Don't be quick to condemn. Don't be quick to judge. Be quick to forgive. Be quick to be tolerant. But don't be stupid either. There are lines. Know where the lines are. Know where the lines are, so then you can be a witness to the truth. Now, unity. There is one paschal mystery. Jesus suffered his passion and died. He rose again. He ascended. He reigns at the right hand of the Father. That's the paschal mystery. That's what is the essential unity. Now, there are certain essential elements of the sacrament. You need to know what they are. I'll help you with some of that. Now, I'm going to tell you what you already know by now. I cannot go into great detail on all these things in the catechism. We don't have time. I'm trying to give you a beginning. 
You know, the Chinese have a saying, the longest journey still requires that the first step be taken. What you will get in this course is a good basic beginning in the doctrine of the faith. But you need to read the book yourself. You need to pray before reading it. Pray during reading it. Pray after reading it. Invoke the Holy Spirit. And then through your study, your prayerful study, your consideration, your meditation, you will begin to interiorize this mystery. And you'll begin to understand it better as well. And you will help build up the church in so doing. So there's a unity. Uh, every sacrament, every place in the church throughout the world has essential elements. You can't mess with those essential elements. The form and the matter, you know, at, at mass, at the consecration. You know, wheat bread in the West, in the Latin Rite, unleavened bread, plus wine from grapes. That's the matter of the Eucharist. The form, the words of institution, the words of consecration. Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, etc. You, you, you can't mess with that. Don't mess with form and matter in a sacrament. However, there are different rites that celebrate those sacraments which have an essential unity. If you went to the Byzantine rite, you would see certain things that are different. They use a lot more incense. Usually it takes longer. Uh, but it's still the sacrament. It's still the essential celebration of the sacrament. The unity is preserved, but there is a diversity that is permissible in the different rites, and that diversity is good. That diversity is good. But within each of the rites, we should be faithful to the discipline established by higher authority. We do not make it up as we go along. It's something we receive and receive and hand on faithfully. Very important. As I said, Christ instituted seven sacraments. I mentioned what they are. These seven sacraments constitute an organic whole. They go together. They go together. If God gave us seven, the church needs seven. You and I individually might not personally need all seven, but the church as a body needs all seven in order to live and prosper. Now, in that organic whole of the seven sacraments, the Eucharist occupies a unique place as the sacrament of sacraments. That's number 1211 for those following. All the other sacraments are ordered to it as to their end, as St. Thomas teaches. So the Eucharist is the sacrament of sacraments, and all the sacraments are ordered to it as to their end. Now I'm going to begin talking about the sacraments of Christian initiation. There are three. And they go together, baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. In the early church, those three sacraments were a unity, and they were given together. In many of the Eastern rites to this day, when a baby is baptized, it's baptized, then given the sacrament of chrismation, which is confirmation, chrismation, and then the Eucharist. A lot of people don't know that. In a lot of the Eastern rites, Little babies, even, are given a drop of the precious blood or a little fragment of the host, or probably both. So the three sacraments are received together, and it's always been that way in the East. They preserve the unity of the sacraments of initiation. Now, in the West, the Latin Rite, we have separated them, and there are reasons for this. We, that allows for greater catechesis to take place in the successive stages. But still, for adults, we know that adults who come into the church on the Easter Vigil, they've been prepared through RCIA, the Rite of Christian Initiation, and they receive those three sacraments together if they haven't already been baptized. So <clears throat> they constitute a unity. They go together. Number 1212 teaches us that the sacraments of Christian Initiation, baptism, confirmation, and the Eucharist lay the foundations of every Christian life. The sharing in the divine life given to men through the grace of Christ bears a certain likeness to the origin, development, and nourishing of the natural life. <clears throat> so we're born anew in baptism. That's our birth. We're strengthened. We grow through confirmation. And then we receive the Eucharist as food for eternal life. 
And so by, these, by means of these sacraments of Christian initiation, we receive in increasing measure the treasures of the divine life and we advance toward perfection of charity. Now, the sacrament of baptism. This is going to take from now into the, about half of the, the next class this afternoon. Uh, and that's, I can only say, just the barest essentials about baptism. You know, it's so important. The first sacrament we receive, it brings us into Christ, makes us members of his body, the church. It, it, it helps us to, well, not helps us, we die. We die to sin and rise to new life in Christ. Baptism is a gift beyond imagination. It is a gift that we can scarcely fathom. And because it is such a great gift, it carries with it a commensurately great responsibility. It is no small thing to be grafted into Jesus Christ and to have the responsibility to make him present in time and space. And that's what it means to be Christian. You've got to put on Christ. It's not just a social thing. It's not just something you just inherit from your family. It's an awesome gift and an awesome responsibility. It's the basis of all the Christian life. It's the gateway to life in the spirit and the door which gives access to all the other sacraments. Through baptism, we are freed from sin and reborn again as new creatures in Christ. We're incorporated to the church and we are made sharers in the mission of the church. Now, what is the mission of the church? The mission of the church is the mission of Christ, for the church and Christ are one. So they can, have, they can only have one mission, and the mission is redemption, salvation, and sanctification of everyone. That's our mission, and we can't rest until we accomplish that mission. The word baptism itself comes from another Greek word, baptizein. It means to plunge or immerse. That plunge into the water you know, the fullest sign of baptism is baptism by immersion. Now, here's an example of some of the things that, that, that change, and sometimes, sometimes change isn't so good if it's a change that seeks to change the essence. But some change is not bad. I've heard people complain. I, one person said to me not too long ago, well, they put a jacuzzi into the sanctuary. Well, it wasn't a jacuzzi. It, you know, it's where you get baptized, and it's not so bad, really. But we are conditioned by our experience. So we're used to having the baptismal font. You know, you hold the baby over the font, you pour the water. Hey, that's baptism, right? Don't, don't mess with, with my head here. Don't, don't give me things that I can't understand. Well, look, there isn't anything wrong with doing it the way the early church did it. Baptism by immersion is the fullest sign of that sacrament. Now, it's just as valid through pouring the water, just as valid, but it's a question of the sign value. And so immersion is the fullest sign in baptism. The very word baptize from the Greek word baptizein means to plunge or immerse. That plunge into the water symbolizes the catechumen's burial into Christ's death, from which he rises up by resurrection with him as a new creature. Dying, rising. That's the symbolism of baptism. There are many prefigurations of baptism in the Old Covenant. Water was always considered a humble source of life, fruitfulness, overshadowed by the Spirit of God several times in the Old Testament. Noah's Ark, saved through water. Water and the sea has also been a symbol of death and trial and tribulation. And so in baptism, being plunged into the water, death brought out, arising. The, the crossing through the Red Sea is a type and prefigurement of baptism. Crossing of the Jordan River through which the people of God entered into the Promised Land. It's through crossing through the waters of baptism we enter into the promises of eternal salvation. Christ baptizes. That's who baptizes. Whether it's a priest or a deacon in the Latin rite or a, an extraordinary minister would be anyone, a lay person, in case of necessity. Uh, regardless of the minister of the sacrament, it's Christ who baptizes. 
our Lord voluntarily submitted to baptism by St. John the Baptist in the Jordan. He was baptized, not because he needed it. He didn't have any sin. What happened? He was baptized, and thus he baptized the waters, making them holy. And from that point on, the waters of baptism are holy, and when we are baptized, the holiness of Christ, the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit comes upon us, and then we are capacitated to live the life of Christ. From the earliest years, the church, from, from Pentecost, actually, from Pentecost, the church has celebrated holy baptism. Becoming a Christian has always been a question of a journey accomplished in stages. Baptism, of course, is the first stage. Now, there is what's called a mystagogy of the celebration. There is a teaching that takes place in the celebration. Gestures and words in the celebration of the sacrament teach us. We begin with the sign of the cross. We acknowledge the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as the source of all goodness and blessing. The sign of the cross. The cross is the sign of salvation. We're delivered from death and brought into life through the power of the cross. The proclamation of the word of God is an essential part of the celebration of the sacrament of baptism. Exorcisms, one or more, are a sign that baptism delivers us from the power of evil. It, it signifies liberation from sin and its instigator, the devil. Number 1237. Those exorcisms, at least one of them, are still in a very abbreviated form celebrated in baptism. Even with uh, an adult, there's a ren renunciation of Satan and all of his power. Poor baby, too. The godparents, the parents, they profess the faith for the, the infant who doesn't have the use of reason. We renounce Satan, right? When, at Easter, when we renew our baptismal promises, that's what we do. We renounce Satan, all his power, empty promises, and so forth. Okay, and then the essential rite, the pouring of water with the words, I baptize you, or the immersion, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, in the Eastern churches, many of them, there is a post-baptismal anointing with sacred chrism, which is the sacrament of chrismation or confirmation. In the Western church, the Latin rite, we have an anointing, but that uh, really indicates that confirmation is yet to come in a, in a future time. Then, of course, for an adult or in the Eastern rites, Holy Communion, First Holy Communion. Having become a child of God, clothed with the wedding garment, the neophyte is admitted to the wedding feast of the Lamb and receives food for his new life, First Holy Communion. And then a solemn blessing ends that the uh, celebration of the sacrament of baptism. Now, baptism, my dear friends, is not to be taken for granted. I, because I'm not a parish priest, I have not done a large number of baptisms. Usually pastors uh, do the baptisms. They can delegate it to someone else. But uh, oddly enough, I've never done a baptism in English. I've done many in Spanish, but I've never done one in English. I'm going to baptize my niece in a couple of weeks. That'll be the first baptism I've ever done in English. But I'll tell you, every single time I've ever done it, I've taken great pains to try to convey to the parents and godparents the awesome gift that's being given with baptism. It is no small thing. We are given an entrance into Christ himself. We are clothed with him. We become one with him. Jesus the head, we his body. You can't get more intimate. Fruit, in its essence, is not a something. It is a somebody. His name is Jesus Christ. When truth is called alive, the lights go out. Darkness falls, and indeed, if your light is dark, how very deep will the darkness be. All the words in this book can be compressed into one word, the eternal word, Jesus the Christ.
So to continue baptism, who can receive baptism? Well, every person not yet baptized and only such a person is able to be baptized. We know that there are three sacraments that imprint an indelible mark, a seal, a character on the soul. Baptism, confirmation, and holy orders. And so only someone who hasn't been baptized before can be baptized. Baptism of adults in the beginning was the norm. For the baptism of adults, the training of the catechumens becomes extremely important because baptism is a sacrament of faith. And so faith is something that normally precedes baptism in an adult. So we have to catechize people. These people should be initiated into the faith, the liturgy, the prayer, the charity of the church. Now, from the earliest years, infants were also, no doubt, baptized. We hear in the Acts of the Apostles, sometimes entire households were baptized, and probably that included the infants. Number 1250 in the Catechism speaks of the baptism of infants. Born with a fallen human nature and tainted by original sin, children also have need of the new birth and baptism in order to be freed from the power of darkness and brought into the realm of the freedom of the children of God, to which all men are called. The sheer gratuitousness of the grace of salvation is particularly manifest in infant baptism. The church and the parents would deny a child the priceless grace of becoming a child of God were they not to confer baptism shortly after birth. And so the church and the parents certainly don't want to deny any child the grace of becoming a child of God. And so we confer baptism upon infants as soon as possible. I was baptized when I was 10 days old. June 1st is the anniversary of my baptism, and I always celebrate it because that, that's a great day. The day we're baptized is a wonderful day. That's the day we're born again, so to speak. We're born again in Christ. We're raised to a new and higher life. As I said, baptism is a sacrament of faith, but faith needs the community of believers. It is only within the faith of the church that each of the faithful can believe. That's why we love the church so much. You know, I, I can't believe without the faith of the church preceding my act of faith. I'm so thankful that I was born into a Catholic family, that my mother and father and grandparents believed they had the faith. Well, the belief of my parents and relatives and the belief of all the church, the parish community, that preceded my belief. It came before me and it helped me. In a sense, our mother, the church, gives birth to the life of faith in every soul. Now, the faith required for baptism isn't a perfect faith, the Catechism teaches us, or a mature faith. It is a faith that has to develop. We don't expect that someone just being, baptism, being baptized has to be a theologian, luckily. But even for an infant, faith is necessary. Not in the infant, of course, because without the use of reason, the infant can't give the assent of faith. But through the parents and the godparents, we give that assent of faith for the little ones. Now, who can baptize? You see how the catechism is proceeding with all these when, how, who, basic things, basic questions to help us in a simple way to understand the faith. Well, the ordinary ministers of baptism in the Latin rite or the Western church are the bishop and the priest and the deacon. That's in the Latin rite, our rite, most of us. Most of us are in the Latin rite. So the bishop, the priest, and the deacon are the ordinary ministers of baptism. In the East, 
the bishop and the priest, not the deacon, or the ordinary ministers of baptism. Now, we know that in case of necessity, anyone can baptize. I remember my mother telling me, my mother was a registered nurse for many years, and she told me that when she was in nurses training back then, they, they taught the nurses, they taught the student nurses that if a baby was being born, they were in trouble, you know, the baby was, uh, maybe the umbilical cord was wrapped around the neck or there was a danger of, of death and the uh, mother was Christian, not just Catholic, but Christian, that they were to baptize right on the spot. And so my mother said she remembers uh, a certain uh, lady doctor who, who was uh, delivering a baby, and that child uh, was not stillborn, but, but about to expire. I don't remember what was wrong, but the doctor knew it, and the baby took like a gasp. They, wasn't, they weren't sure if the baby had died on delivery, but they saw the baby take a gasp, one breath, and the doctor grabbed um, a container of water just poured it right on the baby's eye, baptized you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the baby did die then. It put, took one more breath, and that was it. So they were taught in those days to do things like that. So in case of emergency, anyone, even a non-Christian, can baptize as long as they intend to do what the church does. What does the church intend to do? Baptize. Baptize. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit while pouring water. Baptized. Well, the pagan might not know what baptism means, but they know maybe that, that this family is, is Christian. Well, I want to do what the Christians do. I want to help this person. They have the intention to do what the church does. They have the form and the matter, the form, the words, the matter, the pouring of water, valid sacrament. And so in case of emergency, any of us can baptize. The necessity of baptism. Well, the church has always taught that baptism is necessary for salvation. The Lord himself affirms that baptism is necessary for salvation, number 1257. Baptism is necessary for salvation for those to whom the gospel has been proclaimed and who have had the possibility of asking for the sacrament. The church does not know of any means other than baptism that assures entry into eternal beatitude. Now, I have, I believe, talked about this once before. Baptism is necessary for salvation, yes. The ordinary means of baptism is sacramental baptism, baptism with water, the sacrament. However, we know that there are two other ways that you can receive the fruits of baptism. Number 1258 speaks of that. Baptism of desire and baptism of blood. The church has always held the firm conviction that those who suffer death for the sake of the faith without having received baptism are baptized by their death for and with Christ. All right? So the holy innocents come to mind. Remember when Herod was hunting down all the male children searching for this king of Israel, and he had all the male children under two years, I think, murdered, holy innocence. Well, if a person, let's say, in a country that doesn't allow freedom of religion, uh, there are places still in the world where you, you really can't proselytize, you can't evangelize. Uh, I have a friend who's a missionary priest in India. There are certain places in Pakistan and certain provinces in India where you can't engage in active evangelization. Uh, you could be in prison and even the death penalty for that. Uh, so let's say someone were to stick up for the Christian faith, were to defend Jesus and defend that religion, that faith, and they weren't even a baptized person, say a Hindu, but who had in their heart a sense that this Jesus is really special, that this is is what the Christians say. And that person then were killed for their belief. There's a certain baptism of blood that takes place. That's an extraordinary means. It's not sacramental baptism, but that baptism of blood 
apply to the fruit of baptism and the person is saved through that baptism with blood. Baptism of desire is another way. We know that catechumens who are studying the faith, getting ready, ready to be received into the faith, if they were to, be, to die or be killed before they actually received sacramental baptism, their desire to be baptized is an explicit, or at least an implicit, indication that they desire baptism. And that baptism of desire would apply the fruits of the sacrament. They wouldn't have received the sacrament of baptism, but they could be saved through that baptism of desire. And so baptism with water, the sacrament, is the ordinary means. But there are two extraordinary means, baptism of blood and baptism of desire, by which a person can be saved. Now we know that everyone, God wills everyone to be saved. Scripture says so. God wills not the death of the sinner. The sinner. God wills that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So what about pagans? What, what about people who, you know, they, they just don't have a chance? Maybe out in some far off land, never heard the gospel, never saw a missionary. Well, what about them? Well, number 1260 talks about that. Every man who is ignorant of the gospel of Christ and of his church, but seeks the truth. Now, note what it says. But seeks the truth and does the will of God in accordance with his understanding of it, can be saved. It may be disposed that such persons would have desired baptism explicitly if they had known its necessity. So, you have someone out in the jungles of Borneo, never heard of Jesus Christ, never had a missionary come, but the person hears that voice of conscience within them, that voice of conscience which every human being has it inscribed in the depth of their heart, do good, avoid evil. And so that person listens to the voice of conscience, and such as they know how, they, be, they do good, and they avoid evil. That person even though they have not had the grace of baptism, even though they never heard of Christ, because they are responding to the voice of God, which comes through conscience, that person can be saved in a way and in a number known only to God. We don't know how, and we don't know how many such people. We don't, it's a mystery. But the church teaches that that's possible. So we're not to despair of anyone's salvation, however, that is not to be used as a flabby excuse for not engaging in missionary activity. The church knows of no other ordinary means of salvation other than baptism. Those other things are extraordinary. God can do that. God has given us the sacraments and generally speaking, ordinarily requires us to be bound by that observance, but God is not bound by that. He can operate in an extraordinary manner. And his mercy, I believe, allows him or almost impels him to operate sometimes in that extraordinary manner. Your prayers, your life of penance and sacrifice, your holy life, your life of virtue brings down grace on the whole church. And through the church, that grace goes out to people that you have never seen. Some poor person suffering from cancer in a hospital, some good Christian, uniting themselves with the cross of Christ, brings down grace on the pagan out in the jungle somewhere who never heard of Jesus. And there's an interior movement of the spirit, and that person moves towards the good and rejects evil. That person can be saved. They're saved through the grace of God, of course, but an extraordinary operation of that grace. The grace of baptism. What does baptism do for us? Well, there are different effects of the sacrament of baptism. And these are signified by the perceptible elements of the sacramental rite. You know, I spoke about that a little bit already, the, the pouring of water or the immersion in water, cleansing and regeneration. Baptism results in the forgiveness of all sins. In the case of an infant 
who doesn't have the use of reason and hence can't commit personal sin, original sin is wiped away. They're cleansed. In the case of an adult who may have committed all kinds of horrible sins, I once baptized a man who was reportedly a mafia chieftain, and he was 80 years old almost, or maybe he was 80 or thereabouts, hadn't been baptized, which is odd. Because most guys in the mafia grow up in Italian families, <laughs> and most of them were Catholic back in those days. And he baptized him on his deathbed, and he died. Now, what about that guy? Well, he wanted baptism, and he got it, and it was valid. What happened? Original sin washed away. All of his personal sin washed away. The temporal punishment due to sin, purgatory, washed away. What happens? He gets on the elevator and he goes straight up. And some would say, not fair. I've been good all my life. How come I, I can't have it that easy? Well, I, I suggest you don't hold out. You know, in, in the early church, people actually at times used to wait until they got older in order to be baptized. You know, I, well, I can, I can well see it. Let's see. I'll have fun until I'm 35, and then I'll get baptized, and I'll be in good shape. But you don't know. You could get run over by a bread truck when you're 34, and then you would have a problem. And so baptism removes sin and all the effects of sin. Yet, certain temporal consequences remain even after baptism. We know that we have a tendency towards sin. Even though baptism removes the guilt of sin, we still have a wounded nature. We're wounded as the result of original sin. Also, suffering, illness, and death we still have, even after we're baptized, even after we're regenerated in new life in Christ. Even though we're baptized, we still are susceptible, vulnerable. We suffer temptation. We feel the pull, the attraction of sin. In Latin, that's called the fomes or concupiscence. Uh, that's like the tinder, the, the, the flame. You know, if you have dry tinder, I, I started a, a fire in the the wood stove last week in the hermitage, you know, you put dry wood and maybe papers and so forth, and, and that's very volatile, right? And, and it doesn't take much. All you have to do is a little spark, and it'll go up. And that's kind of how our fallen nature is. You know, a little spark sometimes of temptation, oop, there we go, fall right into it. Well, that's concupiscence. That's an effect of original sin, and so that remains. Uh, that God allows us to remain in that state so we can fight it out to the end. So we can run the race to the finish line, fight the good fight, and I'm going to tell you something, it gives glory to God. Temptations don't hurt your soul. Temptations can be used to sanctify your soul. St. Francis of Assisi was wont to say that temptation is like a ring with which God espouses the soul to himself. Temptation overcome, not just temptation. Temptation overcome is like an engagement ring that espouses the soul to God. Yes, we're tempted. Some of us tempted very violently. We're tempted maybe to anger, to violence. We're tempted uh, against purity. But by resisting the temptation, by remaining steadfast, we give glory to God. And that's a beautiful thing. And so God leaves us in that wounded state to fight it out with the enemy. You know, the spirit of the world, the flesh, and the devil. And in so doing, we overcome the temptation. We're sanctified, purified, and one day glorified. Baptism incorporates us into the church. It makes us members of the mystical body of Christ. We share in the priestly, prophetic, and kingly dimension of Jesus Christ, who is priest, prophet, and king. So when we're baptized, we're brought into Jesus. He's the head of the church, we're the body, his church. We're not our own from that point on. Now this is very important. Number 1269, 
were not our own. Having become a member of the church, the person baptized belongs no longer to himself, but to him who died and rose for us. From now on, he is called to be subject to others, to serve them in the communion of the church, and to obey and submit to the church's leaders, holding them in respect and affection. And I tell you today, there are many who, if you explained that to them, would say, no thanks. I don't want to be subject to anyone else. I'm my own person. I'm not going to do that. I will not be subject to someone else. Well, we're not our own. We have been purchased, and at what a cost, the blood of God. And so he is our master, but you have to remember who your master is. And when Christ, God, is your master, you're free. He doesn't lord it over us. You know, you're not your own anyway. We think we are. In 20th century Western civilization, we think we're so free. Well, I can do whatever I want to do. I've got to be free. i got to be me. I'm my own person. I did it my way. Listen, you're going to belong to God or you're going to belong to Satan because there are only two places you can go in the end, heaven and hell. Everybody in purgatory goes to heaven. And in the end, you have one of two masters. You can behold the beautiful face of Christ or the horrific face of Satan. But in the end, there's only two places you can go. And in the end, there are only two masters that you can have. And so do not deceive yourself by thinking you can be your own man. You will serve God or not in the end. That's the truth. That's doctrine. Don't water it down. Don't mess with it. And don't accept watering down from anyone else. Two places, heaven, hell. And God doesn't put us in either one. We choose freely. I've had a taste of both. Maybe you have too. I prefer heaven. I prefer God because he's a good master. And in him, you enjoy freedom, authentic freedom, the glorious freedom of the children of God. We have to give witness. When we're baptized, we're reborn, baptized as sons and daughters of God. And we have to profess before men, before the world, that we are, in fact, children of God. We participate in the apostolic and missionary work of the church. Baptism isn't some mere social event. You know how sad it is, how very sad it is for a good priest who has to witness in his parish, very often, people coming for baptism or marriage, whatever it might be, he knows they don't know their left hand from their right when it comes to what they're called to in the faith. Uh, you know, good priests suffer because of that. Oh, they do the best they can. You know, you try to teach the faith. You try to give witness. But in the end, you know, it's a social thing. And you have to do all you can to get the point across that this is a great blessing, but every blessing carries with it commensurate responsibilities. The greater the blessing, the greater the responsibility. What is our responsibility from baptism? No small thing. You are to become the living presence of Christ in the world. That isn't a minor thing. That is an enormous gift and an enormous responsibility. We are called to become great with the greatness of none other than the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. This is something that baptism bestows upon us. And we have to respond to that great gra grace with our whole heart, mind, and strength. The sacramental bond of the unity of Christians is found in baptism. We know that it's baptism that brings you into the church. There's only one church. There's only one God. He had only one son. He sent only one son who instituted one only church. No matter what denomination you are as a Christian, whether you're Catholic, Lutheran, 
Presbyterian, Pentecostal, whatever. There's only one church, and it's valid baptism that brings us into the one church. And so that is a, a principle and basis for unity. I've told you before that some of my, my good Protestant friends, even some pastors, I'll say, oh, I'm so delighted that you're a member of my church. I'm so happy to be your brother in the one only church. And if they don't get it right away what you're talking about, they, some of them, especially the southern ones, they, they'll say, I ain't no Catholic. <laughs> and, and, I, and I love them very much, and, and I, think, I think they love me too. And then I say, well, look, there's only one Lord, one God, one Savior, one truth. Now, how is it he could have established more than one church? No, brother, you're right. There's only one church, only one church. Well, baptism is what makes us brothers and sisters with the same one only Father in heaven. And so baptism is that principle and basis for Christian unity. You know, you want to emphasize the positive. It's not good to emphasize the negative. You know, I bring up some of the negative things in teaching because you have to. Why? Because I don't know of any electrical pole that operates without the positive and the negative. You just have the positive, there ain't no power. You've got to have positive and negative. So I've got to emphasize the positive. But I've got to mention the negative so that you're aware of it so you won't step into it. I've got to mention the errors. I've got to mention the traps, the snares, the pitfalls. Why? Because I don't want you to fall into them. I want you to avoid them. So we mention the negative, but we emphasize the positive. And the positive is that baptism makes all Christians part of the same family. And so my Lutheran brothers and sisters are indeed my brothers and sisters. I have to care for them and love them. My Pentecostal brothers and sisters, I have to love them very much, and I have to care for them. And I'm going to tell you something. If I care for them, I want them to have the fullness of the truth, and I want them to have the full means of salvation. I want them to have seven sacraments, not one, not two, seven. Well, that is what the Lord gave us. And so if I love them, if I care for them, and I'd better, because they're my brothers and sisters, then I want the best for them. For well, what else is love other than to, to desire the highest and best thing for the sake of the beloved? And so I desire them to be Catholic. Now, there are some who would say that that's very self-centered, but it's not. It's Christocentric. Jesus instituted the one only church. I want his will to be done. I don't have a better idea than the Lord Jesus. There was only one Christian church for over 15 centuries. The Holy Spirit doesn't make mistakes. And if he did, then I don't want to be in it anyway. But he didn't. For 15 centuries, one only Christian church. It was only in the 16th century with the Reformation that the church began to fracture and splinter. And now we have over 20,000 Christian denominations and splinter groups. That fracturing, that division is sad. Often enough, it was the cause of men, caused by men on both sides. Very often, uh, it was our fault. Often it was the other side's fault. Never mind whose fault it was, the reality is God established one church, one shepherd, one flock. We have to long for that. Baptism is where it begins. As I said before, baptism imprints an indelible character on the soul, a mark, a seal. You're sealed with the sign of God. In ancient times, things that belonged to the king or to a kingdom were affixed with a seal, uh, like, kind of like a brand. You know, if, if you own cattle, you're a rancher, you might have a brand on those cattle. Well, the seal that baptism, confirmation, and holy orders imprints indelibly on the soul, that means it can never go away. It's eternal. From the moment you're baptized, that seal imprinted on your being will never go away, even in eternity, even in eternity. For your undying glory, 
or your undying shame, whatever the case may be. The same with confirmation in holy orders, an indelible seal, an imprint. It basically says you belong to Christ. You are his. And that's a great thing, to belong to Christ. I'm going to speak now about the sacrament of confirmation, also one of the sacraments of Christian initiation. And begin on number 1285. Baptism, the Eucharist, and the sacrament of confirmation together constitute the sacraments of Christian initiation, whose unity must be safeguarded. Now note that, whose unity must be safeguarded. Those sacraments of Christian initiation, they constitute a unity, and that unity must be safeguarded. It must be explained to the faithful that the reception of the sacrament of confirmation is necessary for the completion of baptismal grace. Now, that does not mean that you're not fully baptized if you're not confirmed. You're baptized. If you're baptized, you're baptized. But we're talking about the full operation of the grace of baptism. It requires confirmation to be completed. For by the sacrament of confirmation, the baptized are more perfectly bound to the church and are enriched with the special strength of the Holy Spirit. Hence, they are, as true witnesses of Christ, more strictly obliged to spread and defend the faith by word and by deed. It's very important that we stress this point. You need confirmation. My sister's daughter, my niece, is going to have her little baby baptized. I'm going to do the baptism. I told you that. They've had difficulty finding sponsors uh, for the uh, baptism for, because most of their friends aren't confirmed. Most of their friends aren't confirmed. And in that diocese, I, I'm not sure if it's a universal norm. It certainly makes sense. But at least one of the sponsors has to be a confirmed Catholic. And, and they can't seem to find one. Of all their friends, they have a lot of Catholic friends, but she's about 21, 22 now, and all of her group that she grew up with, she can't find one that's been confirmed. Now that tells you something. There are a great many people who are skipping this sacrament. There are a great many who are receiving it, but my pastor friends tell, tell me that very often, after confirmation, they never see the kids again. They're gone. That's a sad reality. That, that tells us something about the very unhappy state of affairs today. We want to make sure that we're confirmed. Now, if anyone here, just through circumstances, not your own fault, we don't blame anyone for that, maybe totally beyond uh, the scope of, of your ability in the past, in the past. You didn't get confirmed. Please get confirmed. You know, as an adult, uh, you can make arrangements, even that you may have been practicing your faith all along, you're a good Catholic, you go to Mass frequently, receive the sacraments, but you, never, you just never were confirmed. Make arrangements to get confirmed, because it says here that we have to explain to the faithful that the reception of the sacrament of confirmation is necessary for the completion of baptismal grace. That's what it says, that's what it means. And so we pass that on. Let's talk about the economy of salvation in the sacrament of confirmation. We know that Jesus is called the Christ. That word Christ refers to the Messiah the anointed. The Christ is the anointed. Why, what is he anointed with? The Holy Spirit. Jesus is anointed with the Holy Spirit. Remember what happened at, at the baptism in the Jordan? John the baptizer baptized Jesus. By being baptized, Jesus baptized the waters. And then what happened? The Holy Spirit, in the form of a dove, came down upon Jesus. Well, he's the anointed one, the Messiah, anointed with the Holy Spirit. And so we, too, have to be as Christians, right? Christ meaning the anointed, 
as Christians, we're anointed. We're the anointed of Christ. That's what it means to be a member of the body of Christ. The head and the body have to be one. He's anointed. He shares his anointing. And the anointing is the Holy Spirit. This fullness of the Spirit is transmitted to the entire Messianic people. That's us, the people of the promise. Anointing with chrism or holy oil comes from the apostolic tradition of the laying on of hands. All right? Confirmation completes baptism and it perpetuates the grace of Pentecost in the church. Tomorrow we celebrate Pentecost. That's a major, major feast in the church. We commemorate, and not only commemorate, but because it's liturgy, we make present, we enter into that mystery of Pentecost. All right, tomorrow we enter into that mystery of Pentecost. What happened? The Holy Spirit came down upon the apostles and the Blessed Mother in the Cenacle. And what happened? Remember what, what, what they were like there? They were afraid. The doors were locked. They were afraid of the, the persecution of the Jews. Uh, they would get the Romans after them. They were afraid. They weren't boldly proclaiming the Lord Jesus. But then, at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came. How did he come? He came as a driving wind and as tongues of fire. The Holy Spirit we've been given is no cowardly spirit. He's a spirit of power and might, a spirit of courage. And if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're filled with the Spirit which gives you the power to give witness. You're not afraid. You'll stand up to the whole world if necessary and proclaim Jesus Christ is Lord. And if you have to die for it, so much the better. And so the Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost. And then what happened? They began to preach boldly. Peter proclaimed boldly that Jesus is the Messiah. Thousands were added to their number, 3,000 at one time. They weren't afraid. What did they do? They went out in the temple precincts day after day, and they preached the good news. And what happened? All the, the, they dragged them in before the Sanhedrin. They threatened them. Don't mention that man's name again. And what did they do? They rejoiced for having been found worthy to suffer something for the name, the glorious name of Jesus the Lord. That's what the power of the Holy Spirit does for you, and that is what confirmation does for you. Confirmation gives us an entrance into Pentecost. Confirmation should be a powerful outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In fact, it is. That's what happens. With that sacrament, the Holy Spirit's there. The grace of the sacrament is there. Why don't we see a powerful manifestation of it then? at confirmation. I'll tell you why. Because we enter into it half-heartedly, and our people aren't prepared for it properly. There should be a tremendous outpouring of grace when that sacrament is conferred. Some of you have been around the charismatic renewal. Let me tell you something. There shouldn't have been any need for a charismatic renewal. We should have had it all the time. The charismatic church is the original church the Catholic Church where the Holy Spirit is operating in all the charisms. What's a charism? A gift given to an individual for the sake of the building up of the body of Christ, the church, and confirmation, the laying on of hands, the anointing with chrism. The Holy Spirit should rush upon that person, fill them with power. The gift should be unlocked, and they should go forth to proclaim Christ. That grace is there. That grace is there, but it operates only in proportion to the disposition of the one receiving the sacrament. And if you aren't overly thrilled about being confirmed, then there isn't going to be a whole lot going on. You'll receive the sacrament. It'll be there. Sometimes you can, people are in a state of mortal sin. They receive the sacrament. Do they receive the sacrament? If they are in mortal sin, yes, but it's not operative. In a sense, the grace is not able to operate. The mark goes on the soul, but it doesn't work. You know, the grace of that specific sacrament, it's not operating. So let's say 14-year-old person, confirmed, goes to class Monday morning, 
after Sunday and the discussion comes out, do you feel that abortion is, is okay today? And everybody starts in with what's politically acceptable, politically correct. And most of the kids say, oh, well, a woman should have a right to choose and this and that. And the young Catholic person just confirmed because they weren't overly receptive to the reception of the sacrament, cowers and sits there and says nothing. And there isn't any outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and Christ isn't proclaimed, and the faith isn't defended, and we wonder why. Well, the reason why is because we didn't help to dispose that person for the sacrament. The grace was there. The grace was there to give witness. That's what confirmation does. It strengthens us so that we can go forth and boldly proclaim the truth of the gospel. And when someone calls the truth a lie and exalts lies as though they were the truth, confirmation, if it is fully operative, will give you the power of the Holy Spirit to stand up, to look right in the face of hell and say, this is the truth, and that's a lie. Jesus is Lord, and he's going to prevail. That's confirmation. That's power. That's the Holy Spirit. And so we need to be working hard to help to dispose our people who are about to receive any sacrament to be open. And you know, one of the best ways to do it, a lot of people accuse me of just pounding the old law, you know, pounding the old doctrine and so forth. Let me tell you something. The law is important. I respect, I reverence the norms and rules and laws of the church. But I'm going to tell you something that's even more important. I love my heavenly Father. I love Jesus the Lord. I have a relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit. And because of that, I respect that which God has established, in which no man has the right to cast down. The relationship is not somehow diametrically opposed to the structure of the church. The charismatic church and the hierarchical church are the same church. And the charismatic church and the hierarchical church have to live in peace. The charism's always subject to the hierarchy of the church, always obedient, always submissive, always saying, yes, Lord, here I am. Come to do your will. And so with confirmation or any sacrament, we come to do God's will. We come to receive the grace that sanctifies us, the grace of the Holy Spirit, which helps us to become who we are as Christians and as human beings. And the human being who follows Jesus Christ, the perfect human being, himself or herself, becomes more human. That's what the sacraments do for us. They help to Christianize us, and in being Christianized, we are humanized. You see what's happened in the world, especially in our society. As we've de-Christianized society, we have dehumanized society. And I assure you, if you would like to guarantee the demise of this society, allow it to be de-Christianized even more. Allow the sanctity, the holiness, to be drained out of the church because you know it is Christianity that holds the world in being. It is Christianity that keeps this world from sinking right into hell under the weight of its own iniquity. That's what Christianity does for the world. It holds the world in being. And so we want to be more intense in our Christianity. Confirmation is a great sacrament that helps us to do just that. Now, there are two traditions. I mentioned this before, one in the East and one in the West. In the East, in most of the Eastern rites, babies are confirmed at the same time that they are baptized. However, in the West, we've separated this. There's, there's still a union. We still try to preserve and remind ourselves of the unity between baptism confirmation and indeed the Eucharist, the three sacraments of initiation. Now, the elements of this sacrament, 
Well, we know there's an anointing with oil. Well, what about oil? Well, we know something about oil in the natural order. Oil is a sign of abundance and joy in Scripture. Oil cleanses an anointing before and after a bath. It limbers the anointing of athletes and wrestlers. We know that oil is a sign of healing since it soothes, uh, it gives a soothing effect to bruises and wounds. And it makes radiant with beauty and health. So that, that's just kind of the natural sense of, of the element of oil. Now in the sacramental life, the anointing with oil indicates those same things, right? Sense perceptible signs which effect what they signify. So the oil strengthens us. The oil can heal us. The, the anointing at confirmation results in a strengthening of the person. The oil at the anointing of the sick results in a healing, a spiritual healing, a comforting, a strengthening of that person to meet their sickness and even death, if necessary. By confirmation, Christians, meaning those who are anointed, share more completely in the mission of Jesus Christ and the fullness of the Holy Spirit with which he is filled. And then we are sent. We're strengthened through confirmation, and then we share more fully in the mission of Christ. The mission of Christ is what? Redemption. How did he effect redemption? On a cross. What should confirmation do? It should strengthen us and fill us with courage to embrace the cross. And if you're going to be rejected for your Catholic faith, you need to be strong. Some people aren't. And they'd rather satisfy their friends and family members and do away with their faith or limit it or impoverish it or diminish it. But that's not the thing to do. If the grace of confirmation is operating, no matter what the cost, you're going to stand tall for Christ. You're going to go forth with the power of the confirmed. What are you confirmed in? You're confirmed in the grace of baptism. You're confirmed in Christ. You're confirmed in the faith. You're confident, and you're not afraid. And if the devil himself comes against you, you're going to put him to flight because you are in Christ, and Jesus is the victor. And so we are sealed with the Holy Spirit at confirmation. And it marks us as belonging totally to Christ. And you don't have to be afraid of anything, including death itself. The celebration of confirmation is very important. The consecration of the sacred chrism, or the myron, as it is called in the Eastern Rites. The Eastern Rites call confirmation chrismation. I mentioned that once before. The prayer in the Syriac liturgy of Antioch expresses the epiclesis for the consecration of the sacred chrism or myron in a very beautiful way. The catechism uh, notes it, and I'm just going to read it because it, it indicates something very beautiful, a beautiful expression. Some of the Eastern rites have magnificent, magnificent wording and expression in their liturgies. This is the epiclesis the invocation of the Holy Spirit. Father, send your Holy Spirit on us and on this oil, which is before us, and consecrate it, so that it may be for all who are anointed and marked with it, holy myron, priestly myron, royal myron, anointing with gladness, clothing with light, a cloak of salvation, a spiritual gift, the sanctification of souls and bodies, imperishable happiness, the indelible seal, a buckler of faith, and a fearsome helmet against all the work of the adversary. That's the invocation of the Holy Spirit upon the holy oil that you're anointed with in, in the Eastern, right, the Syriac liturgy of Antioch. And we have a similar invocation or epiclesis of the invocation of the Holy Spirit upon that oil. Now, the essential rite for us, most of us in the Latin rite is done by the bishop, usually, it can be a priest who is given the faculty by the bishop, but it's an anointing with sacred chrism on the forehead. It's done, the bishop lays his hand and anoints the forehead, and he says, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. In the Eastern churches, 
the more significant parts of the body, like the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the chest, are also anointed. And, and there is a, a slightly different wording, the seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit. But in any event, the anointing with oil and the words be sealed with the Holy Spirit are the form and matter of the sacrament, the essential part of the rite. Now, I've mentioned some of the effects of confirmation. It roots us more deeply in the divine filiation, which makes us cry out, Abba, Father. In other words, it makes us more fervently sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father. It unites us more firmly to Christ the head of the church. It increases the gifts of the Holy Spirit within us. It renders our bond with the church more perfect, and it gives us special strength of the Holy Spirit to spread and defend the faith by word and action. Like baptism, which it completes, confirmation is given only once. Those sacraments which imprint that indelible seal that I mentioned, they can never be repeated. Those sacraments are baptism, confirmation, holy orders. Those three sacraments imprint that indelible character or seal upon the soul. Now, who can receive confirmation? Well, every baptized person not yet confirmed can and should receive the sacrament of confirmation. To complete Christian initiation, the faithful are obliged to receive confirmation at the appropriate time. Now, I've mentioned how important preparation for confirmation is. We should do all that we can to be prepared to receive this sacrament or to help others be prepared to receive that great sacrament. Number one, in very least, you have to be in a state of grace, of course. It is a profanation to receive a sacrament not in a state of grace. As I said, even if you aren't in a state of grace and you are confirmed, well, the sacrament is received, but the grace and the fruits don't operate until you go to confession and then that resuscitates the grace of the sacrament and then that grace operates. And, you know, so that, that's very important. In a way, I, I can see some of the wisdom of the Eastern churches where they confirm the babies, you know. Uh, I can see our wisdom in the Western Church, too, of being catechized before we receive the sacrament to know what we're receiving. So there are arguments on both sides. So in addition to being in a state of grace, though, we want to have an intense spiritual life. You want to pray more. Prayer, fasting, works of mercy, exercise of charity, you should do this on your way towards confirmation. Why? To dispose yourself for the Holy Spirit. I've been doing this for the last several days for tomorrow. You know, tomorrow's Pentecost. Uh, I know I received the Holy Spirit at baptism, at confirmation, at holy orders. I know the Holy Spirit's one with Jesus, who we receive in the Eucharist. But I'm, I'm constantly striving to be better disposed to receive the Holy Spirit all the more. I need him. I can't do anything without that spirit of the living God who leads us in to all the truth. The minister of confirmation, finally, is the bishop, normally. In the East, however, the Eastern Rite, normally the priest does the confirmation at the time of baptism. We've preserved uh, the bishop doing it in the Latin Rite, uh, because that's the way it was in the beginning. But a priest can do it if the bishop gives him the faculty to do it. However, it's always the bishop who consecrates the sacred chrism or the holy myron, as they call it in the East. Always the anointing is done with the oil which is blessed by the bishop, whether it's in the East or the West. Any Christian who's in danger of death should be confirmed in any priest can do that for him. Any priest can administer the sacrament of confirmation when someone is in danger of death, and they should receive that sacrament if you have time to do it. So we've talked about the sacraments in general. We've talked about baptism and confirmation. And in the final hour, uh, I'm going to attempt 
to talk about what I consider the single most important thing that I'm going to talk about in this course on the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the Blessed Eucharist, the source, the center, the summit of our Christian life. 